All right, I apologize for the delay. Uh, let's see. All right, um, it looks like the Aries Working Group met uh, yesterday. Was anyone able to attend this call? I did. The um, we uh, talked about uh, had a cool demo of a, a native iOS uh, li uh, Aries library in Swift, which appears to be on the way to donation to Hyperledger as part of the Aries project, which was really cool. Um, we also talked about Didcom B2 Interop. Uh, credit goes to Lance from Roots ID, who has done a lot of work in this area. Um, and it starts to feel a lot like we're going to start defining AIP version three with Didcom V2 as a foundational basis for that. So that is in the beginning stages, the very beginning stages, not at the end of conclusion or anything, but um, but that uh, that appears to be moving forward in the community. All right, very cool. Thank you, Sam. Um, looks like Aries Bifold met last week. Was anyone able to attend the, the Bifold user group? All right, looks like they're working on some OCA stuff and some bugs, if anyone wants to dive into that. Uh, Aries Cloud Agent uh, met a couple of days ago. Was anyone able to attend the Cloud Agent Python users group? Yep, the um, the traction uh, demo at Occupy plugins architecture was put forward. So some of the things we'll hear about today. Um, and, and then um, a presentation from ID Union on um, how to use or an idea for using um, interacting between an open ID connect relying party and um, and a didcom you know Akapai um, holder for providing um, proofs so so using out of band to connect between them or at least to um, um, share a credential. So interesting approach. Um, the other topics will will carry on next week, um, but there was good good discussion on this idea of of getting started on on combining OpenID and Akapai. And this right. built on another um, presentation done a few weeks before at Akapug, also on on the same topic. All right, sounds good. Thank you, Stephen. Um... Let's see, looks like Aries Go met last week. Was anyone able to attend the Framework Go uh, planning meeting? All right, looks like they were discussing some Didcom V2 stuff. Um, Aries Framework JavaScript uh, met today. <laughs> I'm not sure if anyone was able to attend this meeting. Was anyone there? All right, they were talking about some credential delay and Didcom v2 support. Um, let's see. Looks like Ursa's next meeting was set for November 23rd. Was anyone able to attend the Hyperledger Ursa meeting? All right, well, you can find their meeting recordings here if you're interested in following up on that one. Uh, Trust over IP has not met very recently. Uh, looks like the technology stack working group met on the 28th. Was anyone able to attend this uh, TOIP meeting? Hey, uh, yeah, uh, this is here. I was there. Uh, finally, I think it was, uh, I just don't recollect, uh, there was, like like you said, because the holiday is not too much attendance, but uh, it was mainly Drummond, uh, and I think Daniel, I think maybe, uh, was there, and uh, we kind of went over the, uh, uh, you know, summarization of what happened at the uh, uh, IAW, uh, you know, seminar in, uh, in California. Uh, that was finally it, and there were a few other things, but nothing more specific. All right, sounds good. Thank you, Sandy. Um... 
And and by the way, uh, there's supposed to be a AITF meeting. I think in fact it's supposed to be at noon today. So uh, for the uh, AI and Metaverse uh, uh, technology framework uh, from the technology stack. Uh, in fact, I think there was supposed to be a technology stack uh, meeting this morning at 10, which I couldn't because I had a conflict with my work. Uh, so I don't know how the updates from there, but I do plan to attend the one at uh, noon. All right, sounds good. Appreciate you uh, reporting back to us. Yep, thank you. Um, Looks like there was a concepts and technology meeting on the 21st. Was anyone able to attend this TOIP meeting? Okay. Looks like they were discussing some terminology uh, for Toolbox 2.0. Uh, did, did, did come. This week was a users group. And uh, and we talked about uh, some of the um, compatibility concerns, but one of the things that came out of that was that it would be really useful to have some test agents stood up. And so one of them um, that was brought up was the just ability to do a trust ping, which is a very crazy simple protocol. But if you can successfully execute a trust ping with another agent, then there's a uh, then a lot of things work. <laughs> and so. Um, <laughs> Uh, which is which is really useful, uh, and so uh, I I volunteered to to work on that, and so I'm, I'm working on a very simple uh, trust ping only didcom v2 agent um, for that purpose. All right, sounds good. Thank you, Sam. Uh, looks like the interoperability group was canceled for IW, and has not met since. Actually, the the interop uh, group met Wednesday. Um, I have not heard the um, recording yet, but Paul Knowles reported on um, overlays concept architect uh, overlays <laughs> OCA um, the overlays um, architecture. So uh, that might be an interesting one to have heard what the latest update is on that. Um, I'm going to catch up on it when I get a chance. All right, good to know. Thank you, Stephen. I will make sure this section gets updated. Um, awesome, I believe that is it for our community updates then. Uh, I will pass it over to you, Kyle, if you'd like Actually, to start sharing. Tim, there's one other you're missing, which is the non creds work um, that's going on. So we met on Monday and um, had a really interesting conversation for those not aware of this that from, um, from, uh, Michael Lauder, um, who talked about some new work he has done and and what could be the foundation of a an on creds um, next generation um, with a number of really interesting features and so on that can be implemented with um, different cryptography um, primitives. So interesting um, presentation. All right. So you're suggesting to add that at the bottom. Uh, there's an. Uh, you might want to add an on creds. I think that's more active than uh, and some of the other things that are um, that are structured that are in there. All right. Sounds good. I can definitely do that. Uh, Stephen, do you have a, a wiki link for non creds? Yes. Um, yeah, I can share that. Um, it's it, Hyperledger and Oncreds is now a project, and so it's on the Hyperledger wiki, and I'll shoot it over to you, Shar. Great. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, well, I think, yeah, with that, we'll pass it over to you, Kyle, if you want to start sharing. Great. Thanks. <clears throat> Let me just get organized here. All right, you can see my screen? Yep, we can yeah. see it. Okay, so um, I'm gonna go through this presentation. Uh, feel free to ask questions as we go. Um, and uh, maybe if uh, Tim, you can keep an eye on the chat uh, for questions that might come in the chat, uh, just let me know. Um, so I'm Kyle Robinson. I'm the Senior Strategic Advisor for the Energy and Mines Digital Trust uh, Project. Uh, it's being run with the Government of British Columbia. 
In this presentation, we're going to talk about digital credentials for organizational identities in the natural resource sector. So Energy of Minds uh, Digital Trust is um, really working on the BC government uh, digital trust ecosystems. Um, there's also work going on with the Ministry of Citizen Services um, with a different project, uh, but we are uh, working very closely together um, on the, you know, an overall BC government digital trust ecosystem. There's a number of different use cases involved. The use cases that the Energy and Mines uh, space is looking at is around sharing sustainability data, certifications and credentials, um, particularly between uh, businesses and government entities. Uh, not so much in the personal identity space. Um, <clears throat> so one of the, there's three sort of um, opportunities that we're looking at for um, using this type of technology, self-sovereign identity, verifiable credentials um, in the context of sustainability reporting. One of them is more efficient processes uh, for reporting. And so the technology stack actually allows for better efficiency um, and uh, for sending data around. Because at the end of the day, really the, the SSI uh, or verifiable credential uh, technology stack allows for data transport between different parties um, in, a, in a structured manner. Um, current processes are often unstructured. So they're emails or PDF reports or things like that that are just emailed around. Uh, but this uh, allows us to have more structured processes and uh, data standardization. The next uh, piece for that is increased trust and security. So there's a lot of um, third-party verification that's often done in this space of sustainability reporting. And so uh, an end uh, receiving party for information really wants to know that they trust the data they're receiving, <clears throat> uh, which has been audited by a third party. The, again, this technology allows for that, you know, digital signature to be baked into the uh, credential itself, uh, which that end party can examine and, and understand where it comes from uh, to see the trust. Uh, the other important thing um, is actually selective disclosure. So we're looking at, we're reusing Hyperledger uh, non-creds um, to enable selective disclosure. And one of the primary reasons there is uh, there's a lot of data that is uh, handled between businesses uh, that's, you know, reviewed and audited, but not all of it is um, shareable to all different parties. But we, what we want, is, back to the efficient processes, is we want to reuse data sets <clears throat> that have been trusted um, rather than recreating multiple data sets with different subsets for different parties. So um, using selective disclosure, you can have one credential, let's say, with like 100 attributes of information, uh, which covers many, many use cases for who all the different parties are that you want to share with, for regulatory reporting, uh, uh, voluntary reporting, uh, adding to an ESG report, uh, sending to investors, sending to a bank, all these different things. You want to use the same set of data. Um, so you don't have to constantly get it, new credentials in different formats with different subsets of data, which is, again, what's happening today in the form of PDFs and, and that kind of thing, or recrafting uh, data sets. So selective disclosure, for those not familiar, is a mechanism where you can have 100 attributes of information, and then you can pick only uh, the subset of information that that receiving party needs. So the receiving party might want uh, 10 different attributes of that information. Well, the, they can specifically ask for those 10 and you can use the 10 values from that specific credential to fulfill that request. And it has the same digital signature as if you were to um, share 15 different attributes of information. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so uh, a little bit more on the credentials. We talked about efficiency of reporting. Uh, there's increased accuracy. So right now, there's often a lot of data manipulation that's done in Excel. Uh, somebody will, you know, copy and paste data from this source to that source, reframe it, um, and then copy it somewhere else. Again, this is all this reformatting and subsets of data. So increased accuracy is uh, important. 
um, so that you can actually have the data all the way from the root um, source and, and it's just passed all the way through using these uh, data standards and uh, the technology. Uh, we talked about improved trust and, and being tamper-proof uh, for transmission, privacy preserving, this, so they're only sharing uh, what they want. Um, maximized markets is uh, so where the natural resource companies uh, allows them to compete in these global markets. So what we're seeing right now in the market is um, particularly in Europe is there's a requirement for uh, responsibly sourced products. And then to get that to that responsibly sourced product, there needs to be a digital signature on the product and verifiable credentials allows that to happen. There's a couple other potential technologies um, that are being looked at, but there are sort of verifiers in the in your trust triangle sense in the market space that are looking for those credentials. They want proof that the data is, or the, that the product is sustainably sourced. And this also uh, dovetails into the uh, supply chain uh, solutions. Um, and, you know, we're just uh, innovative technology. So this is all very cutting edge technology um, and positioning British Columbia uh, as a actor in the natural resource uh, international trade space. Um, to enable our uh, companies in British Columbia to uh, do this kind of thing. Um, so the so Energy and Mines Digital Trust as a, as a project, as a bit of a program, are enabling these companies to uh, participate in this space. Okay, so in EMDT, we have two teams. We have a one team that is working on our pilots at our use cases, working with different stakeholders. We'll talk about that in a sec. And we have another team, which is our developers. And so our development team is working on a thing called Traction, which was mentioned earlier in the call. Um, it's open source software and we're being built on top of uh, Akavai and Indie. It's um, right now it's architected so that the we're building plugins um, on top of Akavai, uh, very similar to uh, the plugins that Indicio has been building um, using that Akavai plugin architecture so that you can have an existing Akapi and then add those plugins to get the additional features and functions. For the most part, the um, plugins that we're building are a user interface and uh, to a certain degree data storage, like tables that would get added into Akapi. Um, there's one that we're working on, which is basic messaging, one that is a tenant UI. So it's a user interface on top of Akapi to manage the tenant and all the different things that you can do with it. And then uh, the third main one is the innkeeper uh, UI or the innkeeper plugin. And so that's for managing uh, multi-tenant uh, solutions for uh, Akapai. Um, yeah, that's probably good there. So, so that's our technology uh, team. That's what they've been working on uh, to support all of our pilots. And so this is our updated ecosystem graphic. Um, and what we've got on here, uh, this is actually new, this graphic. Um, so this is the first, uh, first group to see this updated version. The, on the left-hand side on the legend, we see there are uh, the, these different credentials, all these different shield icons. They're indication of the credentials that are being issued. And then uh, the second part here, is the digital wallet technology that's being used in a pilot sense. Uh, the digital wallet technologies have these orange, like the orange border for traction. So we'll see that around something like this uh, energy mines and low carbon innovation entity. So they would be using traction. Um, we, in our pilots, we're using, we're partnered with Northern Block. And so we have some actors in the ecosystem using Northern Block technology interoperable. It's also based, it's Akapai based uh, using Hyperledger Aries. Uh, so that's uh, interoperable there. And you can also see this green one, which is on open earth. Uh, so they're using a base Akapai uh, integration. We also have uh, talked with Sferity. Um, I don't know if we actually have them marked in here, not yet, but that is a partner that we're working with, uh, Sferity, they're also interoperable. So that's more into the supply chain 
They're a, a company based in Germany. Um, so what we see here in overall in this ecosystem is on the left-hand side, generally these are issuers of credentials and you can see the different types of credentials that they would issue. In the middle, we would have to our holders. So these are companies, these are natural resource companies uh, based in British Columbia. So Copper Mountain uh, Mining Corporation, they're a mining company. They have a facility in the middle and in interior of British Columbia. Uh, tech, they have eight different mine sites, I believe, um, throughout Canada. I can't remember all the locations. Uh, Tourmaline and Pacific Cambrian, those are uh, natural gas uh, producers. So they have pipelines, uh, they, they extract natural gas and uh, send natural gas through pipelines to be uh, sold. On the far right hand side, we have our verifiers. And so what we see is open earth. They're a voluntary um, reporting mechanism or reporting warehouse for uh, greenhouse gas emissions and pledges for climate change. Uh, the Mining Association of Canada, uh, they are uh, doing a, a, it's called TSM, which is Towards Sustainable Mining, which is essentially a uh, ESG type of a report. Uh, the Linden Metal Exchange is the LME. Uh, that's one of the European markets. And then we have the British Columbia Climate Action Secretariat and the BC Oil and Gas Commission. Those are both regulatory bodies in British Columbia. And then at the bottom, we have Goyang City, um, which is uh, the actual city in South Korea. They're a consumer of um, natural gas from British Columbia and expansive. They're a market uh, for uh, natural gas, for greenhouse gas emissions. So there's a lot going on in our ecosystem. We've talked with uh, all of these different parties. They're all at different stages of involvement with our pilots. Um, our primary group um, that we started out with is PricewaterhouseCoopers, Copper Mountain, and Open Earth right at the top there. So on to our next slide. I'll just pause there if there's any questions, actually. The next slide, I'm going to show a video our demonstration. All good? Okay. Energy and Minds Digital Trust is enabling a global digital ecosystem to make it easier and more secure for natural resource companies in British Columbia to share sustainability data. This demonstration builds upon existing regulatory emissions reporting processes. Because this is a pilot, it does not satisfy or replace regulatory reporting obligations. In this demonstration, we will show how Copper Mountain Mining Corporation uses a digital credential issued by PricewaterhouseCoopers to share with the Government of British Columbia's Climate Action Secretariat. Annually, PricewaterhouseCoopers verifies Copper Mountain Mining Corporation's legislatively required greenhouse gas emissions data. Having verified Copper Mountain's data, PWC uses Northern Block Orbit to create a digital credential. PWC inputs the data into each field and issues the digital credential containing GHG data to Copper Mountain. Copper Mountain sees a new notification from PWC. Copper Mountain logs into Northern Block Orbit to view the credential. Copper Mountain selects the new credential, inspects the data, and accepts the credential. They now own their verification statement as a digital credential and can use it to fulfill requests for information. Copper Mountain begins by sending a presentation proposal in order to share GHG data with the Government of British Columbia's Climate Action Secretariat, CAS. CAS's traction wallet auto accepts the proposal and triggers a request. Copper Mountain then reviews the necessary information, selects the digital credential, and sends to CAS.
CAS requires mining companies that emit above 25,000 tons of CO2e a year to verify their GHG emissions annually, adhering to the Greenhouse Gas Industrial Reporting and Control Act. Using traction, the Climate Action Secretariat can see how Copper Mountain has sent their digital credential. CAS has the ability to see that PricewaterhouseCoopers verified this data and issued the digital credential. CAS still reserves the right to check emissions reports for accuracy. This demonstration is one of several EMDT pilots, exploring how sustainability reporting can be made more efficient in the natural resource sector. Contact Energy and Mines Digital Trust to learn more and to watch a live demonstration of a credential exchange. This demonstration uses traction and northern block technology. All right, so uh, that's the video. Um, if you have uh, want to connect and uh, talk more about uh, the work that we're doing, uh, there's my contact information. That's a QR code that goes to LinkedIn. Um, and so now, Tim, we can open it up for some Q&A. Thanks for the, the presentation, Kyle. Yeah. Um, what's yeah. what's next from the pilot? What are some of the main things that have been learned? Oh, boy. <laughs> um, well, um, on the technology front, um, we're actually working uh, even more closely with the Citizen Services Group to align our technologies um, because the, the traction components that you see um, could be used for any of the different use cases. And so we're working on uh, doing some alignment with uh, for uh, just the government as a whole and how that's gonna, what that's going to look like. So that's our, our development uh, side of the fence. Um, for our pilots, um, we're actually working more uh, on the natural gas um, space. And so there's a couple things that are very late breaking that um, we're working through. Uh, one of our uh, the natural gas uh, companies that we're working with uh, is interested in uh, well they're they're actually setting up IoT sensors to detect um, fugitive emissions, which is um, basically gases that come off of facilities that are producing natural gas. And so those sensors are IoT devices. And so one of the ideas that we're looking at is uh, to have those IoT sensors, be issuers, um, either there's software built into them or there's a centralized system that would be integrated with um, to have them actually issuing very regular credentials of the emissions, let's say weekly, um, for example. So you would be able to get weekly emissions from an IoT devices credentials. And then those credentials can be used um, to basically add up and, and fulfill the needs for um, you know, weekly, monthly, yearly uh, requirements uh, in a trusted manner. So again, that's very early, um, but that's some of the things that are being explored uh, with the natural resource space is the uh, integration with IoT device uh, systems. Cool, that sounds really interesting. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'll just pop back to our ecosystem slide for a second. This one. So yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot going on in our pilots over here. Um, again, all at different stages. Um, a lot of the work that we've been doing on our pilot team has been uh, with these credentials and looking at the actual uh, data structures for them. Some of them don't really already exist. Some of them do. Um, some of them have existing governance, <clears throat> what we would call governance uh, information. So for example, towards sustainable mining, they have pretty good data, um, or sorry, governance structure for what a TSM credential is and the way that it's used. So uh, from a governance perspective, we're looking at uh, how we can leverage the existing work that's been done and how what you know gap we need to fill for a governance 
uh, for the actual verifiable credential form of towards sustainable mining credential. Uh, same thing with, with some of these other credentials is how we're filling the gaps on the governance. Yeah, thanks for the presentation. So I think mm -hmm. that like my company is working on a similar project from the other side of it for carbon sequestration or solar panel capture. And I guess the major differences that leap out to me is like probably I think what you mentioned before, like we're, we're capturing more data at the sensor level. So actually at the raw source that's mm -hmm. captured a verifiable credential. So it's a, I would say it's a, it's probably a little bit more robust audit trail right back to the sensor itself. And then I think like, and then it, it eventually it does tie into carbon credit ecosystems yep. um, that are fully like third party auditable, which I think, you know, you have a lot of those elements here, but I wondered if you see that tying into like, the purchase of carbon credits or into those larger ecosystems and then how far back to into the like into the source of the data you think this system would go it's a good question so um what we've talked about the, um if you're not involved there's a, a a um greenhouse gas emission task force that's just been started up with i think it's trust over ip um Maybe somebody can can correct me on that, but uh, or we can chat after. Um, and one of the things that we talked about in that group is looking at it from a bottom up or a top down perspective. Um, and when I what I mean there is the bottom up would be going to the very very source of the tiniest little um, report, like if it's an invoice of diesel fuel, you know, from last month or something. That's maybe as far back as they can go. Uh, to actually get the, the data uh, that contributes to the higher level you know, yearly amount. So that's the bottom up approach or IoT sensors on certain pieces of equipment, uh, even just a gas gauge on a, on a dump truck or something. The other way to look at it is to um, go from the very top and just say, you know, what, we're just going to deal with the total um, for now and uh, get that uh, moving through the ecosystem, um, and we will figure out how to take all the different pieces of data underneath to get to that total. There's a need for verifiable credentials for all of it and how it all gets kind of chained together and added up. Um, for our pilot, we're, we're starting from the top. And so there's an existing process where uh, it's a regulatory reporting process uh, that was showed in the video where it's just sort of a total number. There's a lot of work that's done outside of the system to get to that number, uh, but it's still at the end of the day is a trusted number because it's been audited by a uh, third party in this case. So it's PricewaterhouseCoopers. So the, the trust is that PwC is attesting to that number based on the work that they had done prior to it, to creating that number really. Um, sorry, they get the number from Copper Mountain, but they verify it. Um, they do a site visit and all these other processes uh, to make sure that that is accurate. So that there's so that's the top down or the top down and bottom up approach. Um, the other thing um, to answer your question on the carbon credits or the carbon markets is this is one side of the equation of a net zero um, sort of result. And so to do a net zero report, you have to first. Um, you know, document and uh, report on all of your actual emissions to say, yes, we are emitting, you know, 97,000 tons of CO2e a year, right? That's your, that's your starting number. Then you need to look at your carbon markets to be like, okay, well, we need to figure out how we can get, you know, 97,000 uh, offsets or credits so that we can report that we're net zero. And so, I definitely see there to be a linkage here. Uh, it's unclear at this point how that linkage happens, but it's something that needs to be done at least by the, uh, the company in the middle. So Copper Mountain, for example, if they wanted to report net zero, they would be able to use kind of what we're building in this ecosystem to have verifiable you know, credentials that speak to that 97,000 tons of emissions. They would need to use maybe a related system or a connected system or, or some other mechanism 
maybe it's just a carbon credit thing. And then Copper Mountain can bring those two numbers together in a trusted manner to say, this is our offset. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, I, I guess my follow-up would be, yeah. I think like using verifiable credentials makes a lot of sense to me for the bottoms up approach. I'm yeah. just curious on the tops down approach, because like, it seems like yeah. what you mentioned, like PwC already does on-site inspections, like they're the auditor. They've already been the one on the site counting the number of dump trucks and the amount of fuel. So then what value does PwC get from receiving a verifiable credential, which I guess is just kind of reasserting the data that they've already audited, or maybe I'm missing something. Yeah, so P so in this case, PwC is not getting the credential, they're issuing the credential. So they are actually taking data from Copper Mountain. There's a bit of a process um, to, you know, for where Copper Mountain actually like, you know, sends all their invoices and all that fun stuff to PricewaterhouseCoopers. They also have a process for the do site visit, which is actually from a regulatory reporting perspective, a requirement for, uh, to do a site visit and to have a plan and, and these kinds of things. And it needs to be third party audited. Um, so PricewaterhouseCoopers is actually the issuer. They're the ones that are issuing or attesting to the numbers. Um, Copper Mountain gets to hold that number and then they can do what they want with it. They can share it, they can put it in the ESG report, those kinds of things. Does that help answer that? Yeah, sorry, I was reading your diagram backwards. So I, oh, thought, okay. it, I, thought, okay. the, I thought the data was coming from the right side to the left side. Uh, no, it goes from left to right. Yeah, yeah. Issuers are on the left here for the most part, holders in the middle, and verifiers on the right. So these people on the left side are the ones attesting to information, or creating creating information. And then the middle group is holding it. The group on the right is consuming that information. Yeah. Great. Great questions. Any other questions from the group? Okay, well, if you have follow-up questions or wanna get connected, uh, you can email me or check me out on LinkedIn. Um, but for now, I'll pass it back to you, Tim or Shar. Sounds good. Thank you, Kyle. Um, I believe that was pretty much all for today. Uh, be sure to join us next time. We will be hearing from, um, shoot, let me pull up his name real quick. I think we'll be hearing from um, Dominic Zaiskowski. Um, yes, I so believe so. Um, looking so, forward to that presentation. Yes, thank you, Shar. Um, yep, the next meeting will be on December 15th, and we will send out Discord reminders as well. So thank you all for coming, and uh, the recording will be up soon. Have a good one. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.